right. Well, hello all and thank you for joining us today. My name is Emily Sanders and I'm a moderator for KCFF this year. Today I am joined by our guest, Elmaya Tail Feathers, who is the director on the film Jimabi, uh, pardon me, Jimabi Bitsin, The Meaning of Empathy, which is a film featured in our KCFF 22 lineup. So if you have just viewed the film and are joining us, welcome. And if not, be sure to check out our digital platform to get a ticket. So this film has won the Audience Award and you won the Emerging Canadian Filmmaker Award, both at Hot Docs last year. Congratulations. I also saw this morning that this film has received the nomination for the Ted Rogers Best Feature Length Documentary for the Canadian Screen Awards this year. And it's also there for the categories of editing and cinematography. It's clearly making waves. How does it feel to have your film recognized in these ways? Um, well, thank you. Uh, it's quite surreal, to be honest, because, uh, you know, it took five years to make the film and we started back in uh, 2016. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so much heart went into making this film um, mm -hmm. and it was imagined to be a, an educational tool for my community and for other Indigenous communities who are impacted by, by the opioid crisis. And um, I, I never really imagined it to be something that would, you know, <laughs> be nominated for awards or to receive awards. So it's quite surreal. And um, it's also really special just to see the work of my community and stories from my community uh, being screened in so many, uh, you know, unique spaces and mm -hmm. um, and that it's being recognized as, as, as a story that has a value and importance um, more broadly to the Canadian public. Mm -hmm. Well, again, congratulations. Before we get into more questions that I have pertaining to the content and what happens in the film, I really wanted to know where did this film first begin for you? When did you first feel the need to make this documentary? Uh, well, the, um, the crisis hit our community in 2014. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's been, it's been eight years. Mm -hmm. um, and I heard from my mother so many times about what she was witnessing on the front lines. And I saw all of the incredible community mobilization that was happening. Um, and for, I, I would say a year and a half, um, it, was, it was very present in our community and, and in my, my thoughts and in my heart. And um, it was when I started to think about the ways that the community was represented in the news media, mm -hmm. that I realized that I needed to create something um, to contrast sometimes harmful narratives of my community that I was seeing. Um, often the news media was framing us through, uh, you know, a trauma and tragedy lens rather than uh, looking at our community as one that has strength and, and a community where there is so much action happening on the front lines and, and people mobilizing and trying to find uh, answers with so few resources and so many barriers. So I felt obligated to um, provide a counter narrative to those stories. But also, um, I just felt so deeply inspired by my community and all of the work that that I was witnessing happening on the front lines. There were just so many community meetings every week. People were, were going to meetings and obviously not being paid for their time. Um, and just giving everything that they could and, and really working from this, this idea of Gimmapi bits and this Blackfoot value that means to have empathy and to take care of each other. Um, and I felt it was so necessary to, to, to bring that to screen. Um, but further to that, I, I think when I started, you know, thinking about this film, I knew so little about harm reduction. Um, I, I think I knew kind of like the, entry level kind of basic understanding that a lot of people do in the general public. And um, it was through witnessing what was happening in my community and through conversations with my mother that I began to understand the, the values and the ethics that, that harm reduction is rooted in um, and, and came to understand that harm reduction can look like many different things. Um, and that it's a conversation that is so divisive and contentious, not only within Indigenous communities, but 
Canadian uh, cities across the country. You know, it's 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 very divisive. Um, and I felt obligated to explore that complicated conversation and to present it through a human lens, through the experiences of people who are impacted by harm reduction policies and, um, and services, um, both as those on the receiving end of those services and those who are offering them on the front lines as, as caregivers and, and healthcare workers and outreach workers. Um, so all of those things were, were really kind of at the core of, of my own desire to, to make this film and, and, and a, a kind of my obligation as a community member to make it. Mm -hmm. Your, um, thank you for that. Your response also makes me think of that moment with Shay when, you're, when you kind of teach him as well about different ways of going about harm reduction and the use of Suboxone. Um, I was wondering, how did you facilitate these interviews and access the various spaces that we find you occupy throughout the film? Um, well, I, I feel like I should mention that uh, Shay passed away um, in, the, in the fall um, and he, like so many others in the film, um, have mm -hmm. passed away and that's something that I, I didn't really foresee happening when I started making this yeah. film that so many people we see on screen would, would, would uh, mm -hmm. end up passing away. Uh, yeah, I'm so sorry to hear that. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, he's very much been in my thoughts and his family as well. Um, but in terms of, of, of those uh, interviews and, and, and that it was all about relationship building and getting to know everyone that we see on screen and there are so many people who didn't end up in the film and that was really hard to to make that decision <laughs> to, to cut it all down into two hours mm -hmm. um but I, I i really felt like it was important for not only my own community but for the broader public to understand that there's a, a really broad spectrum of experiences and opinions when it comes to this very complicated issue and um, in order for people to be under, to, to, for people to understand harm reduction, to understand the opioid crisis, to understand, you know, the history of colonization and, and current policies that that deeply impact Indigenous people on a on a, on a daily basis, um, in particular those who live with uh, substance use disorder. Uh, I felt like it was so important to include this, you know, broad spectrum of voices and to humanize these, these issues and this history and the legacy of, of all of that um, through the experiences of, of the people we see on screen. And so a lot of the, um, the work in terms of just figuring out how to tell that story just came down mm -hmm. to um, spending time with people in my community and listening um, and you know, a lot of times people would say, oh, you should go and talk to so-and-so, mm -hmm. they, they have, and, and so a, a lot of it was really just, was community-based filmmaking. And um, it was a tremendous honor. Like every single moment yeah. I got to spend with my community and document what they were doing was, yeah, a, mm -hmm. a tremendous honor. And, um, and it was also really complicated in the sense that, um, documentary filmmaking has in many cases a, a harmful legacy with with telling the stories of marginalized people because so often these stories are coming from outsider perspectives and um, I felt it was really important to interrogate the processes that you know I've learned as a filmmaker and and my own power and privilege as the filmmaker in terms of making editorial choices and and you know, choosing what moments of, of someone's interview or life end up on screen and in, in the final mm -hmm. film, um, because that can have, you know, very powerful ram ramifications later on down the road. And so, yeah, a lot of it was about also just communicating throughout the process with, with everybody that participated and letting them know, you know, um, you have, you have the power and control in this situation. And um, I, I showed nearly everybody a, a cut of the film before it was finished to make sure they were happy with it. Um, and it also is why I kind of decided to put myself in front of the camera um, because it's such a vulnerable position to be in, um, in front of the camera. And I felt like, well, if I put myself there with them, 
it'll at least feel a bit more comfortable and and it may be safe in in some ways to to be in that position. Mm -hmm. Um, What has been the response to the film? You mentioned that you showed a a cut to everyone who was involved. Um, Yeah, what's been the response? Um, People have been really happy with it which is really nice. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I, I'm, I'm actually really pleased with how our screening went last week in, in Cardston, in the town of Cardston. Um, my mother and I uh, joined for a screening and, and did a Q&A after, and it was organized by the town of Cardston and the West Wind School Division. And we were quite nervous because like so many towns that border reserves, um, there's a a really complicated history and a lot of um, racial divisions. And um, it it was definitely kind of a scary place to walk into, Um, but the conversation went so well and um, the film ended up helping people better understand harm reduction and what it actually means and what it actually looks like and why it's necessary in many cases and and you know the fact that it's an evidence-based practice Mm -hmm. um and so that felt really good to know that an audience that I was kind of terrified of showing this film to um, was able to connect on a on a human level and so I think that this film is is enacting change in in a positive way and um, it feels really good to be a part of that process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the the impact is so immediate of the film, so you you totally get that throughout. Um, you mentioned your mom. I really wanted to know how is the detox site at your mother's hospital, the hospital where she works. How is it doing now? Uh, it's it's going well. Um, they have some long term funding, which is great. They've expanded. Um, they've literally saved hundreds of lives and changed yeah. people's lives. Um, the baby that you see at the end of the film. Um, he's now a toddler and he's doing really well. His mother's doing well. And I think there's something really, really special about, mm-hmm. about um, the fact that, you know, children are, are being kept within the community because the, you know, the child welfare system, yeah. sorry, um, mm-hmm. the child welfare system has done so much damage to our community. And it's, mm-hmm. it's special to know that places like the Bringing the Spirit Home detox or keeping children with families in community um, in, in really safe, beautiful ways. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's doing well. And my mother continues to work tirelessly. Mm-hmm. Um, she's doing a lot of Q&As for this film. She yeah, I everything. Um, yeah, so so that's that's how things are yeah. going. Oh, that's so great to hear. Um, I'm sure a lot of people watching the film will have this question, but you have already kind of mentioned it in part, but I was wondering if you were able to share with us how any of the community members that we see as a kind of update towards the end of the film in 2020, how they're doing now, if you kept in contact with them. Yeah, um, I was just home a few days ago. Um, I drove from Vancouver to Winnipeg and stopped at home on the reserve for a little while. And I saw George and Leah, they're essentially in the same situation. Um, they're doing, yeah, the same, which is, it's frustrating because I, you know, I, they deserve housing. They, de- they deserve safe, uh, supportive housing. And um, I really think that a managed alcohol program would, you know, do a great deal of help. Um, for the Moses Lake community. And so that's something that's, um, you know, an ongoing conversation. Um, As I said, uh, Shay passed away. So that's been very hard. Um, Lori is doing well, all things considered. Um, She continues to work and take care of um, many children in her life. And um, she's participating in Q and A's, which is really wonderful. And uh, yeah, the community as a whole is, is, is still doing well, but um, the pandemic combined with some really detrimental policies and funding cuts by the United Conservative Party government of Alberta has been really um, harmful to, to our community, especially people who use drugs and people who are houseless, um, especially in the city of, Van- or the city of Lethbridge. Um, since the closure of the supervised consumption site, uh, the rate of death due to uh, drug poisoning, mm-hmm. or unintentional overdose, um, 
is the highest I believe it's ever been. And, you know, those, uh, those deaths are largely Indigenous people, uh, many from, from my community. And so it's quite bleak in that way. And I think um, that what's happening there is happening across the country, uh, especially with the pandemic. And so I, I certainly hope that um, there's a change in government in Alberta um, and that there is a move towards supporting harm reduction. Um, in British Columbia, they're talking about safe supply, which is incredible. Uh, I know that's a really contentious issue for a lot of people, um, but just recognizing the, you know, the violence associated with, with the illicit drug market um, and the way it's impacted my own community, I think safe supply would, would cut out the middleman of, of, mm -hmm. of dealers who are doing very violent things. Um, so yeah, it's, it's complicated. There, there are definitely positive, happy ending kind of stories and mm -hmm. some really challenging stories. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, after, after this film departs KCFF, after it's done, will we be able to access this on the NFB or CBC Gem or Crave? I'm sure a lot of people will be sharing this with others. And so where can they watch it next? Yeah, um, they're, the NFB is our distributor and they're working on our, our, uh, our distribution plan. Um, I believe it'll be available with one of the public broadcasters soon in the spring um, and it'll be available later in the spring on the NFB website and I believe um, there will be some video on demand platforms that will also have the film so um, if people want updates about that they can follow us on Facebook or Instagram um, and they can also go to the NFB website um, and we're happy to facilitate any you know community-based screenings or institutional screenings, um, just reach out to the National Film Board and uh, we're happy to facilitate that. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and just before we finish up, can you tell us about any other projects that you're working on right now? Um, well, I am in uh, Winnipeg in the production office um, for a new show called Little Bird. Um, it's a Crave original dramatic series about the 60s scoop. Um, it's created by Jennifer Podemski and Hannah Moscovich and myself and Zoe Lee Hopkins are each directing oh, yeah. a few episodes. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's, it's a wonderful project and uh, it's a really important story and I'm very excited to be a part of it. Um, but oh, we're that's... just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great to know. And uh, Zoe Lee Hopkins film is at KCFF this year too. So oh, cool wonderful. You guys are collaborating. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. I'll let her know that I was just talking with you guys. She said yeah. she's saying no to all Q and A's right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I talked to Dakota who is Oh, great. Lead. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. She's wonderful. Yeah. Anyways, thank you so much for joining us. To those listening, just a reminder that KCFF 22 runs from March 3rd to 13th of this year. Please check out the other videos in our series to hear from other fantastic filmmakers and talent in Canada. So thank you. Thank you.